This is a response to Leighton Way's video entitled For PETA's Sake, in which he takes that organization to task for their recent filing of a suit in federal court demanding the release of five orcas at SeaWorld, saying that their captivity constitutes a violation of the 13th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, which prohibits slavery and involuntary, involuntary servitude. First, I want to extend my greetings to Leighton. I followed uh, you for a couple of years on YouTube, and I have enjoyed your work. The crux of Leighton's argument is that protections in the Constitution apply only to human beings and that the orcas, clearly not humans, are, are not so covered. He therefore views the filing of this suit as either misguided or as a stunt. Leighton does make it clear that if the issue at hand were concerns about the humane treatment of the Sea World orcas, then he would have no trouble supporting actions on their behalf if he were convinced that they were indeed suffering as a result of their confinement. I want to add that I appreciate his sympathies in this regard, but I also want to state clearly that I, unlike him, am not persuaded that the orca's captivity results I'm not persuaded that the orchid's captivity does not result in their suffering. This, though, I acknowledge is not the point of his video. So to summarize my disagreement with Leighton, I would say that although I believe that PETA has no case here in the legal sense of the word, I do believe that they have a point. I think he is wrong in calling the PETA filers stupid. I imagine... Uh, and I know that there, there is the unintended uh, pun that he mentioned of PETA, PETA files, but I'll try to avoid that. I imagine that they are quite aware that, they, that their clients, so to speak, will not be granted standing in federal court and that he is right in identifying the legal action as a stunt while underestimating the historical importance of such stunts in advancing the cause of civil liberties. My position here hinges on the word person and the implications of that term in and beyond the context of the U.S. Constitution. It's interesting to note that the word person does not appear in the text of the 13th Amendment. It shows itself most prominently in the 14th Amendment, specifically in its celebrated Equal Protection Clause, which I'll quote here. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor, shall, sh nor, sh nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Lest I be called stupid, I, I don't for a moment believe that the intention in these Civil War amendments was to extend rights to non-human animals. I do think that the equation of a person with a human being here that Leighton makes is problematic. Adult women, undeniably human beings, were denied the benefits of the equal protection of the law at the time that the 14th Amendment was adopted and for decades thereafter. Indeed, part of the motivation behind the failed Equal Rights Amendment passed by the House of Representatives in 1971 was to address the lack of clarity of the 14th Amendment in this regard. I would note also that opponents of the ERA, as it was called, at the time considered the entire matter something of a stunt. Perhaps the most significant contribution of the 14th Amendment was the introduction of the notion that a person, at least before the law, is not derived from a biological fact, for example, race or gender, gender or dare we say sexual orientation, but that personhood, if you will, is a legal status having to do with worthiness of the protection of the law. Personhood independent of biology is a concept that has been championed by the philosopher Peter Singer since the publication of his book Animal Liberation in 1975 and extended by him in his The Expanding Circle a half dozen years later. Although these and other works Singer has, uh, 
and although these and others work by Singer have made him a lightning rod of the animal rights movement, the fact of the matter is that the notion that non-human animals, according to their capacity to suffer, their awareness of self, and their sophisticated cognitive and social capabilities, has become less and less controversial uh, over time. And the heirs of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, founded in 1824 and almost certainly considered the PETA of its day, are now part of the civic mainstream. To demonstrate where the equation of human being with person fails in the other direction, we need only consider the several attempts underway in the individual states here to declare that a fertilized human egg constitutes a person under their constitutions, an equal protection clause for embryos, if you will. There is, of course, no denying that these entities are biologically human, but the question of their bearing rights that we associate with persons is a matter of significant political controversy. The point is this, that personhood is a useful abstraction having to do more with rights and protections and less to do with possession of human DNA. A common trope in science fiction stories and films asks us to imagine how intelligent and humane, but non-human, alien life would be treated if they found themselves as castaways on our terrestrial shores. How would we address the question of the civil liberties of such sentient creatures knowing full well that no founding father or amendment writer had ever contemplated extending the protection of our laws to them. And how would we deal with an intelligent but distinct hominid species that we might encounter here? There is so, certainly no chance of this happening today, but the discovery of the possible species Homo floresiensis nicknamed the Hobbit, which lived in the island of Flores in Indonesia as recently as 12,000 years ago, a blink of the geological eye, forces us to consider such a question. With the appropriate beating of butterfly wings in the course of history and prehistory, perhaps P-E-T-H, people for the ethical treatment of hobbits, might find themselves in federal court today filing for the release of these creatures from Hobbit World based on a putative 14th Amendment protection. I'm sorry, 13th Amendment protection. Uh, of course, their detractors would be characterizing them as stupid, ignorant of the fact that constitutional protections apply only to human beings. To be clear, and, I, and, and to try to minimize the amount of criticism that I certainly will certainly receive from some quarters, what I have to say here is in no way a general defense of PETA, uh, neither of their policies nor their tactics. I do, though, think that the question of equal protection before the law for certain non-human animals is an important one. It is an issue of great humanitarian significance, one which I believe is being appropriately spotlighted by legal actions such as the one undertaken by PETA this week. And although I, I doubt if I will live to see the day, I am relatively confident that some future Supreme Court decision or amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America will extend limited legal privileges and protections to non-human persons, and that the case law that will be cited in the associated deliberations will mention uh, the PETA action of this week. As usual, I will end this video by saying that we are all in this together, and here I will emphasize that we are all in this together as persons under the law. Thank you.